Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Digital Supply Chain Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Mike. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, Tom. Absolutely. Yeah, first off, thanks for having me. My name is Mike Sigler. I'm a senior director at Nexer, a global company that specializes in supply chain logistics. Okay, super. And you specialize in Nexer in supply chain log logistics, you say, but what aspect of it? Because you could be doing anything from driving trucks to, you know, it, it, it's a big area. What do you guys specialize in <laughs> in supply chain logistics? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a broad category. But for my own specialty, I'm also a former co-founder of a company called Rangeline Solutions, where our direct focus was on ERP solution providing. And so my specialty is around just that. So ERP products, we're a Microsoft partner. So we specialize primarily in that Microsoft flavor of ERP solutions. Okay, cool. And this is an interesting time, both for supply chain with what's been happening the last few years, but also for Microsoft, because we've seen in the last few months since November 30th, let's say when ChatGPT launched, a huge upsurge in interest in AI and particularly in ChatGPT. And Microsoft, I shouldn't say they've jumped on that bandwagon because they launched that bandwagon in a sense in that they were one of the early backers of OpenAI, the developers of ChatGPT, but now they've put more money into it and they've also started to roll it out in their own products. So we've not seen, or I haven't seen anything yet appear in the supply chain space from Microsoft around generative AI. Is it coming and what kind of things do you think if it does come, it could do? Yeah, so the, the short answer to your question is yes, it is coming. <laughs> I think faster than a lot of us realize there are numerous areas in the, the Microsoft product suite where AI is very quickly gonna have a large impact in just productivity and being able to rapidly make more informed decisions than we could before. Microsoft generally in the ERP space has their kind of flagship product for ERP, Microsoft Dynamics 365. And with that comes a supply chain insight utility, perhaps, that is beginning to leverage the Copilot platform to really quickly drive, I guess, information and collaboration with the, just as a specific example, maybe if you're working in the procurement department, you know, being able to leverage the different information AI can review from perhaps like local news articles for maybe flooding in an area that one of your vendors is located and being able to quickly recognize that with this vendor, you have orders one, two, and three being placed and instantly react to that news, be able to craft through the AI tools, craft an email to this vendor to confirm if the orders that you have with them are being impacted by this data. So it's very, I guess, I'll call it collaborative, you know, with your day-to-day -day role, just helping you have more access to information and react to it more quickly. Okay. For people, Mike, who might not be familiar with the idea of Copilot, maybe you could give people a quick 101 on that. I know it's what they've added to the likes of Visual Studio and to the Office products, but, you know, for, for people who are unaware, maybe... Walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. Copilot is very aptly named, in my opinion, because it does act as your copilot. You know, when you're using these different Microsoft products, whether it's the supply chain insights tool I was somewhat just describing, or other Microsoft solutions in their Office suite, such as, you know, Word or Outlook for crafting emails. And that copilot tool can leverage AI and uh, some of the different generative language capabilities for uh, analyzing patterns, generating responses, maybe to questions that you have of, um, you know, the data trend that you're seeing and perhaps in an Excel spreadsheet. So it, it takes a lot of the AI tools that, you know, folks like myself included can have fun with chat GPT, asking it questions and having it perform a ton of, you know, analysis on just data that's out on the internet and be able to provide very detailed and very natural sounding responses. 
So it takes those very advanced capabilities and basically integrates it to the Microsoft Office platform. Yeah, yeah, no, true. And so I've been using the search functionality of Bing and the chat part of Bing since shortly after it launched. And I have to say, I've stopped using Google because it's so much better. Google is fast, but it, it, it's fast at giving you long lists of answers that, you know, you then have to scroll through and scroll through to get past the ads and to find one that I, might actually be useful. Whereas on the Bing search with the, the chat component, you ask the answer, it gives it to you, as you say, in kind of natural language. And it also tells you why it's giving you this answer. It gives you the, the references, the sources where it found the information. So it's significantly better in, as a search tool than Google has been. I know Google are working with their solution, which they call BARD. And we'll see what that's like when it comes out eventually. The co-pilot function, I've not had a chance to try that yet, but the, the demos I've seen look interesting, particularly in things like, I, I assume many people listening to this podcast, for example, use Excel regularly. And the co-pilot functionality in Excel sounds really compelling. I know we're not talking dynamics yet, but even just simple things like Excel, Outlook will have it built in as well. And Teams was one of the first ones they announced. If people are users of Teams, there's going to be a version of Teams with a built-in GPT functionality, which will do things like transcribe the meeting, but it will also give a summary of the meeting at the end, along with a to-do list for people just based on listening to the conversation. Now, that's mind-blowing enough for me, but... Talk to me a little bit more about the the potential for dynamics and, and for supply chain professionals where you see it really having an opportunity to shine. Yeah, I, I think you touched on some great points there. I, I think the element of impacting productivity from, you know, it, they're not simple, but you know, a, you know, simple applications such as Excel, AI can really shine in its pattern recognition and is you know touched on as well the summary capabilities of boiling down some data trends in these spreadsheets that maybe have thousands and thousands of rows so it, that's where the pattern recognition and that ability to use some of the natural language components to boil that information down to very digestible components mm -hmm. as it relates to the ERP side and and you know somewhat specifically with dynamics the components that play into supply chain are where we take those analytical pieces from Excel and like it was we're looking at trends and needing to perform day-to-day -day functions through procurement and making sure that our manufacturing components of the business have the right components and tools they need to deliver products on time and and you know as and I guess and having the materials that are required that component you know can have a ripple effect through so many different areas of the business. And if you have the right tools with, you know, being enhanced by artificial intelligence or AI, you can react to those things much more quickly. So I, my example may come back to, you know, if you have, you know, years and years of historical data on your purchasing trends for what products arrive on time and maybe from what particular vendors, AI would be able to quickly help you analyze, you know, what vendors are delivering product on time. So you can maybe quickly adjust that if you know maybe a particular vendor is running into a product shortage, you can quickly react to that information and reroute your purchasing from a different vendor so that your processes downstream, more on the manufacturing side of things, may not feel an impact at all because they'll just now have the product when they need it to fulfill it on a basis. So I think the, the biggest impact is some of that ripple effect that if you solve challenges upstream, your entire business can work, operate more smoothly through the rest of the processes. Okay. Okay. Regular listeners to this podcast will be aware that, you know, I'm ex SAP. I worked for SAP for six years up until last year. And one of the things I, I had a public facing role, so I would often be approached by people to say, listen, Tom, we want to talk to someone in SAP about XYZ. 
who's the best person to talk to? And it's a 100,000 person company with three and a half thousand products in the product catalog. You know, so often I wouldn't know off the top of my head. So I would go away and try and find out internally and come back three or four or five days later and say, okay, I found out now, this is who you need to talk to. Chat GPT and GPT large language models have been fed almost all the information that exists on the web. It occurs to me, and I know this is what's going to happen, OpenAI have said they're going to allow companies to feed their data into a large language model so that you can then run the likes of a chat GPT on your own internal data. And I think something like this would be completely mind-blowing because, like I said, three and a half thousand products in the SAP product list or whatever it is now, 100,000 employees, you know, if I could have just opened up a chat screen in front of me while people were asking me these questions and just find all that information and go, yep, here you go, here's who you need to talk to and, you know, that is going to, I feel, be massively transformative for most companies, particularly if they can house the data internally rather than having to upload it to the open AI servers. And I think that's coming as well because there are now open versions of large language models alongside the open AI one, right? Absolutely. I think that's going to be you know, an area of concern I, I imagine people will have is, you know, is still revolving around this idea of the cloud. You know, it, it mm. feels like we've had it for a long time at this point, but I think data security is something that folks will always be cognizant of and, and making sure that their data is well protected. Uh, so I definitely agree with your point that if it can be a local instance of, you know, that chat GPT kind of AI technology to review local data, I think folks will absolutely gravitate towards that just to avoid any potential security concerns. But the, yeah, I mean, to your other point as well on, um, you know, leveraging the skill sets of internal employees and being able to quickly identify resources to, to work with maybe for particular questions. I think the overall point with some of these technologies is that they're only as good as the information they're given. And so as you bring in these additional data sources, to your comment around maybe skill sets. That's already a huge advantage these organizations can use is saying, yeah, who can I talk to that knows X, Y, and Z you know, about this topic? The other advantage is that as you start to you know, take that you know, to the next level of incorporating kind of back to the, the Microsoft side of things, maybe Microsoft Outlook you know, with calendars and being able to then suddenly you have skill sets on top of that availability. And so you can know, hey, who has availability for a meeting two weeks from now on this topic and start to layer this information together and have these tools like ChatGPT be able to quickly take that data and boil down the patterns it can identify and give you the information you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use ChatGPT quite a lot just on these podcasts, for example. I'll take the transcription of the podcast feed it into ChatGPT and then, you know, ask it a couple of questions based on the transcription. Sometimes it gets it wrong. Like I'll ask it to pick out three highlight quotes from the episode and it'll make a couple of them up. So this is a bit of a worry, right? I mean, <laughs> you can't have that happening with your supply chain. Well, you you could, but you shouldn't have that happening with your supply chain, right? How do you How do you fix that or make sure that doesn't happen? That's a great question. In a lot of ways, you know, it, it harks back to the idea of having a healthy dose of skepticism, you know, in just your day-to-day -day life and to a certain extent. You know, it, it comes back to the, the very old quote at this point of don't believe everything you read on the internet. You know, just the <laughs> idea that it takes a, a level of responsibility around reviewing some information that's, you know, presented to you and, and understanding that this is new technology. It's something that it is possible, you know, that mistakes can happen, but that's the beauty of a tool as advanced as artificial intelligence is that the more you teach it, the smarter it gets. And so as it is learning, you know, what is correct and what's not and where there's tolerance for kind of filling in the blanks versus making broad assumptions of in incorrect quotes or, you know, just presenting information to answer a question, despite it maybe not having all the information. So 
in summary, I'll say, you know, it is new technology and mm -hmm. folks, I think, have every right to be nervous or cautious about the use of that technology. But at the same time, there is a tremendous amount of potential with it. And I think as we continue to use it, it will just do nothing but improve. And those instances of hallucinations or maybe um, false positives or just different misrepresentations of the results will gradually you know, fade into being extremely rare circumstances. Okay. And what about implications for things like privacy and, well, privacy, let, let's go with privacy right off the top, because that's one that some people can be worried about. So, you know, would you trust a GPT with your private information? That is also a good question. It's, it's something with like chat GPT and in my own personal information that in, in some ways I feel that the data collection being done already, you know, before the introduction of chat GPT and before AI has, um, I guess proliferated, you know, throughout so much of our daily lives that, you know, we're asked to sign up, you know, and provide our email information or phone number for simple day-to-day -day services that we use. And so I think there's a bigger topic or a bigger question to address there just around data privacy as it relates to the individual throughout society. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a bigger topic I think could have its own dedicated podcast related to, but as it relates to Chad GPT and AI, at this point, I mean, the information is out there, I think, you know, whether we want it to be or not. And I think having a tool like Chad GPT or, you know, in, in different forms, you know, AI be able to review that data and analyze it perhaps in a much more natural way and be able to get to information faster, ultimately, I think is a good thing. It's just, you know, there's that bigger topic of our information's distributed across across the internet as a whole. Yeah, yeah. How are, you know, the likes of Microsoft and other tech providers, how are they going to handle the fact that A, it's got phenomenal potential, but B, there are also phenomenal potential downsides. Like if it does hallucinate something incorrect and someone bases a decision on it, you know, that's a, a large tech headline waiting to happen. How do you, how do you avoid that? Yeah, absolutely. It's something that with any new technology or any new platform, there is inherent risk. And especially as you're incorporating it into processes that are Im as important as you know, perhaps, you know, again, coming back to that procurement example of you're responsible for purchasing, you know, hundreds, potentially you know, millions of dollars worth of material for your business. That's a very important, you know, responsibility in the organization. And with the risk of misinformation coming from a tool such as ChatGPT, I think, you know, companies like Microsoft and any others that are rolling out these solutions will have to have a, a healthy balance of incorporating those tools into the overall processes, but somewhat within the bounds of the you know gatekeepers and safety checks of you know the chat gpt or ai is producing maybe this purchasing list you know have that list still go through a series of approvals and have you know kind of that human touch still on it to make sure that it's not making these sweeping assumptions that are wrong or having purchase amounts be wildly inaccurate but i think that level of gatekeeping and you know workflows for approvals I think it's still going to be a, a very necessary component, at least in the immediate future, you know, at five, 10 years from now, you know, there may be enough confidence in that tool to let it, you know, just do its thing. But um, there's still going to be, I think, quite a bit of gatekeeping and making sure that the tool is saving everybody time and, you know, doing that analysis and the summary of that data, but not taking away the responsibility of, just pushing through and, and making sweeping decisions without that human touch. Yeah. Yeah. I find when I'm working with it on the, the podcast here, it means I can get far more work done in the same amount of time than I could do before I started working with it. In prep for today's podcast, I went to ChatGPT and I asked it a couple of questions. So the first question I asked it was, 
what are some potential use cases for generative AI in supply chain slash manufacturing? And it gave me a long list of 10 points with explanations for each one, starting with demand forecasting, then inventory management, supply chain optimization, supplier selection and risk management, quality control, predictive maintenance, production scheduling, product design and customization, new materials discovery, and workforce planning. Those are the 10. Each of those 10 has a paragraph about why it chose those as its you know, potential use cases. So then I asked it another question, what are some potential risks of using generative AI in supply chain? And it gave me another 10 paragraphs, you know, over-reliance on AI, data quality and accuracy, security and privacy, black box problem, ethical considerations, legal and regulatory compliance, integration challenges, misaligned expectations, skills gap, environmental impact was the last one, which I thought was an interesting one to throw in there. And finally, I asked it, what first steps should supply chain manufacturing organizations take to embark on the use of generative AI? And it gave me this time 11, a list of 11 points, each one a paragraph on different things organizations could do. I mean, just that alone is, is, is to my mind fascinating. So what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to take those three questions and answers and put them into a blog post. And I'll link the blog post in the notes of this podcast. So if anyone's interested, they can go and check out the, the questions and answers. But I mean, even that alone speaks to how, I mean, the answers were great. It, I mean, it, it, it blew my mind that it, it, it was able to come up with all that stuff. And the cool thing is you can go in and say, okay, the, the, the first step it talks about here in what steps should organizations take, the first step it says is assess current capabilities, conduct a thorough assessment of your organization's current supply chain and manufacturing processes, technologies, and data management capabilities to identify areas where AI can add value. So what you do then is you go back to ChatGPT and go, in point one, you said I should do an assessment. What would be the first few steps to take to undertake that assessment? And bang, it'll come out with a you know a sub a subset of things you need. To, it's just you can go deeper and deeper and deeper, and it's it's I'd say it's like going down a rabbit hole, but it's not because it's all fascinating and productive stuff. It's all things that you know stuff you might not have thought of. So it it can make you absolutely to my mind, incredibly productive about things that you might not have been able to do in the past. I completely agree. It, it's amazing the ability to summarize that information and especially, you know, being able to progress off of previous answers and previous information that it, to your comment on, you know, what steps should we take, you know, in step one, what should we do here? We've done that. Now what? Kind of being able to progress and understand previous responses and act on those answers and new information because the just yeah <laughs> it, it's mind-boggling the application that this can have and especially as you're able to drill down and and you know provide it more information about current situation that you're in and have it react and, and continue to you know compound on that data hmm. We're coming towards the end of the podcast now, Mike. Is there any question that I haven't asked that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to be aware of? I think it's important for folks to be aware of just the user adoption element. You know, in our you know, line of work, I think often it's referred to as change management. And something like chat GPT, AI, uh, to folks maybe unfamiliar with it can perhaps have a negative reaction to the thought of using it and thinking that this tool will replace my job. You know, this tool will put humanity out of work, you know, and, and some of these extreme reactions, when in reality, it is trending to be more the opposite. You know, it's not so much that it's eliminating jobs, it's changing jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's allowing you to spend, you know, instead of maybe four hours of your day being spent updating a spreadsheet, it's spending, you know, 30 seconds having Chad GPT analyze the data, get you the information you need and allowing you to then spend the rest of your day working with other teams on, in your company and being able to, you know, spread that information and more accurately being able to make decisions about the rest of uh, your workday and how you want to spend that time, be more productive with the information you have. So I think the biggest component coming back to the original idea of change management is working with your team and your company to 
work through those points that chat GPT suggested on, you know, how to leverage this tool, but also working with the, the team to best display that value, you know, that it can provide and that it's not, you know, replacing everybody with, you know, army of robots. It's empowering people to, you know, make better decisions and coming back to the Microsoft idea, be your pilot, you know, in, in your day-to-day, -day, you know, work life. Yeah, cool. Off topic, I should also say that ChatGPT is for phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal at suggesting recipes and giving cooking instructions. I just know that from, from trying it out. You can tell it, I've got all this stuff in my fridge. What can I make from that? And it'll give you some incredible ideas and the full steps in preparation of them. So if, if anyone listening is interested in cooking and hasn't tried ChatGPT for that, I suggest you give it a shot. You'll be really pleasantly surprised. But OK, <laughs> enough off topic stuff. <laughs> Mike, if if people would like to know more about yourself or any of the things we discussed on the podcast today, where would you have me direct them? You can find me on, for myself, they can find me on LinkedIn directly. Um, there's also the Nexer Group website that will, I think, link in the show notes, but both through Nexer and myself directly, you can find us. Perfect. Yep. I'll put those in the show notes for people to find them. Great. Mike, that's been fascinating. Thanks a million for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's been great.